and we're live. Man, that was slow. <laughs> it's Rebecca Hogue from Virtually Connecting, and today we are going to have um, a special conversation on open dissertations. Um, and just a little bit about sort of why I'm interested in this. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Ottawa, and I'm studying um, health blogs. So my data is inherently open, and I'm sort of an open scholar. So um, that's where my interest comes with this, and I'm going to throw over some introductions. So over to you, AK. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is AK. I'm from uh, the University of Massachusetts, Boston, but I'm also a uh, doctoral student. Um, I have still haven't figured out what the difference between the doctoral student and the doctoral candidate is, but I'm pretty sure I'll figure that out soon. Um, and I'm interested in open dissertations, uh, both uh, for the open aspect, uh, but also the um, fact that I'm going to be doing a dissertation soon, so I I want to know more about this. Hi, I'm Brittany Brown O'Donnell. I am a currently a PhD student. Um, I might step down to an EDS in Instructional Design and Technology at Virginia Tech. Catherine? Hi, everyone. I am Catherine Cronin. I am speaking to you from Galway in Ireland. I am an open educator and researcher of open, educa of open education, uh, specifically open educational practices at the National University of Ireland in Galway. And I have been an open practitioner and open researcher for some time. I'm due to complete my PhD in about a year. So I know that it will be open, but I haven't decided what form that will take yet. Awesome. And Samantha, we're going to go over to you. Hi, I'm Samantha Streamer Venaruso. I am um, we're just starting the dissertation process. I'm a student at Northeastern University, but I live in Maryland and teach at a community college in Maryland. Um, for me, this is I'm very interested in open ed, similar to Catherine. And um, I'm thinking about lots of different ways that my I'd like my research to be open and my, this process to be open. Awesome. And um, Nadine asked us to skip over her right now because she's having connection issues. So we'll jump back if she can get in in a minute. Or actually, here we go. I'll read hers. Um, Nadine, and I don't know how to say your last name. Um, does anyone else? Figured I'd ask that. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm going to butcher it, but I'm going to try it. Um, a boomag or a boomeg? Um, um, she works at the Center for Learning and Teaching at the American University in Cairo, and she's currently pursuing um, her master's in educational leadership with a concentration in higher ed and planning to write an open thesis. Um, and she's going to try logging in from her phone so she gets better connection. <laughs> okay, over to you, Samantha. Oh, I already went. <laughs> you already went. Okay, brain. Bonnie. <laughs> oh. Hi, uh, I'm Bonnie Stewart. I'm in. Uh, Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. Uh, I work at the University of Prince Edward Island. I also completed my PhD in April of 2015. Um, one of the first two grads from the uh, PhD in Educational Studies in our Faculty of Ed at the University of Prince Edward Island. And I did it as openly as I was able to and have been interested because I was an open researcher through the process. I studied open educational practices and network practices of scholars. And so I wanted to try to make sort of the, the process and the product of my dissertation match its content. And institutionally, um, was actually in a lot of ways lucky to be part of a fairly new program. So I had some flexibility there, but also found that there were nonetheless a lot of institutional, um, both in my local sense and in the bigger picture sense of academia, uh, norms that had to be kind of brought into focus to even discuss doing a dissertation openly. And so it's, it's an area of interest for me. And Laura. Hi, I am Laura Gogia. And like everyone else, I think who's here, um, I am a open scholar and I just finished my PhD in February of 2000. 2016 on learning uh, and I did what 
I, I consider to be a open dissertation. Um, Bonnie, who uh, seems like uh, much more creative, um, I did things and then later figured out that um, it was different than the way of it. Um, I blogged through my dissertation process. I, I tweeted through my dissertation process, not only on content, but also on the experience of being a dissertation student, um, a graduate student. And because my process was so open, um, I did my, my defense in a very open sort of way, too. I had people come in and live tweet my entire dissertation um, defense presentation that occurred afterwards. Um, and that was, that was an um, event. You know, people from all over the world, including a lot of the people who are here um, today in this session, actually came. I live tweeted defense, um, and they were there with me, and it was just, it was just one of the most I've experienced in my lifetime. So um, I'll talk about that more uh, in a little while. But um, yeah, so through this process of having done it and then looked back and reflected on what exactly I did, I've become interested in trying to figure out different ways of being open through this. The dissertation process because uh, it's not a yes or no it's not a black or white there's different ways so there's multiple spectra um, components of the process that can be open or being to get out of our talk today is I'd love to hear what you guys think about what open dissertations are um, around different parts that can be open the barriers the benefit, it's not always uh, necessarily good for everybody to do everything in the open. And so we can talk about that too. All I have to say. <laughs> and I now that you guys say, I'm to take notes. I'm Laura Godia. Okay. <laughs> um, can I just pick up on what Laura had said? So one of the interesting things I loved uh, watching the feed of Laura's live tweeted dissertation defense um, because we had come to know each other online while we were both kind of coming towards the end of our PhDs. And um, we each had open aspects to our defense processes, but different aspects. Um, and so mine was not live tweeted, although I think there were some tweets that came out of the room during the public presentation, but mine was done at 8 a.m. on a Friday morning. My presentation, because my um, my external examiner was in the UK and had a sort of afternoon scheduling commitment, everything had to start really early in Prince Edward Island um, to, to get going, and I had my external examiner come in virtually and one of my committee members was virtual. Um, and then two of my committee members were also in the room. But we, at my university, we do a public presentation for half an hour or so and then public questions and then the sort of private questioning grilling period. And um, in my case, the, uh, the, the, my presentation was live cast it was it was broadcast um, over YouTube and so that made for a, a Twitter stream to be possible because people from all over the world were sort of tuning in and and um, and watching and it was really nice for me because you know at 8 a.m. on a Friday morning I wasn't sure how many people were actually going to show up locally for this um, it's I said it was only the second uh, education defense that had happened at my institution and so um, I was really excited and enthusiastic about the idea of sort of having both participants in my research, including uh, Catherine, who was, was one of the participants in my PhD research process, um, but having all of those participants able to see it as a fairly transparent process um, to contribute to it if they want it. Um, yes, I just got a question in the chat were people able to ask questions. There were questions after my presentation. So I literally had like 30 minutes on a timer done and then people could ask questions and one or two of the questions that came in via Twitter um, were 
asked in the room in addition to questions from the room. Now, I was really lucky. Part of the reason that happened is because my partner does the same work that I do and works at the university. And at the time, another very good friend of mine was the instructional technologist at the university. And so between them, they managed the feed and they managed the video and, and all of those pieces. Had I had to set that up entirely on my own, um, in addition to preparing just to do my defense at eight o'clock in the morning, that probably would have been a piece that would have been much more challenging for, for me to manage. Um, in my case, yeah, I, I blogged, like Laura, I blogged kind of all the way through the process. I actually got to a point where I had to totally go back and start my thesis proposal all over again. Um, and for me, the openness was actually always a protection. I, I researched some of the risks that are involved in openness and talking to collapsed publics and um, what can happen if institutionally you're perceived as deviant for doing work in the open. These are all things that I'm aware of, but for me, the work that I was doing in the open, in a sense, helped at a couple of places for me to navigate um, my sense of my own professionalism and capacity and the value of my work when I wasn't always clear early on that it was fully legible to um, my early committee and the people that I was working with. And so the open feedback and openly blogging my, even my challenges and the look, I've got to kind of go back to the drawing board on this. Does this make sense? Talk me through this. I had, you know, a stream of 30 some blog comments. Um, the time that I kind of went back and went, look, this is kind of where I'm at. I'm going to open this up to this community of academic Twitter who are largely my network and community. Does this make sense? Is this legible to you? Because I understood that maybe for institutional academics and scholars who were not as actively practicing in these spaces, some of the things that I was trying to sort of stumble towards might not be legible. And so for me, the openness was also um, partly an accountability to the open audience, but also a way of making sure that I was understood and um, making sure that I had an audience who, who could fully understand and appreciate what I was trying to say. So early writing had, had always been um, sharing my process and some of my content openly, um, blogging some of the research process itself. And then I actually made my dissertation document uh, CC, CC BY, so Creative Commons licensed. It's not a copyrighted dissertation. Bonnie, you made a really, really good can, point that made can me I really piggyback? think okay. about um, the idea of being open during the process because the committee members don't necessarily understand. Like it really made me and me sort of realize like I'm studying blogging, but not all my committee members or my supervisors even know what blogging is about or really understand blog the blogging medium. Mm -hmm. um, and so in some ways using them getting asking them to read my blog occasionally might help them understand the blog thing maybe I, mean, I worry about the risks and it depends on if people are willing to change their own practice so i mean it's 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 hard right supervision is not a particularly um there's another process go ahead and, and there's a component to this too i mean one of the things that you brought out so beautifully is that um and, and this was for me as well, is that at my home university, I didn't necessarily have my people. I mean, my, my advisor and my very um, surroundings at Virginia Commonwealth University Academic Learning Transformation Lab, I mean, very supportive community, two or three people. There was no at my, you know, um, no other, you know, no one to talk to, no one to bounce ideas off of. So some of this going outside was about finding finding my my people and finding my voice and learning what it meant to be professional um, and and have a academic role around these ideas. But the that I hadn't heard yet was that I was actually um, because it's one thing for me to learn things on my own and read and read and read, which we all do, but to be able to get feedback and bounce ideas 
um, and, fi and find mentors. People have been doing this longer um, might have. And, and so that was one of the reasons why I was blogging and trying to reach out to people. That's how I got connected to Catherine Cronin, who here I can see her one of my mentors, and Francis Bell, and Bonnie Stewart, and all of you guys who have been doing this longer than me. You guys were actually serving as my faculty. The one or two people at my campus asked me, I, I needed you guys to teach. It, it was truly about opening up my, my faculty and finding faculty. And an Good informal. Laura, company. I just want to mention you're having you're cracking up a bit for us. Um, so if maybe you hold your mm -hmm. microphone um, when you're talking, because I think it's when you move your head that it's cutting in and out. Okay. I nope, that didn't help. That. No. Okay. Um, what I did catch you saying, <laughs> what came through clearly was, was that idea of having sort of a choral faculty, right? Having all these people out there who can contribute to your learning process and mentor you through the process. And I, I actually think increasingly the role, the role of supervisor is a hard role because, and the more that people start exploring areas like this, um, areas of scholarship that have not necessarily been conventionally part of the role of scholarship until the past few years, um, you're going to be pushing people's boundaries and comfort zones and also just knowledge spaces. And, you know, I'm now in, in the privileged position of getting to supervise a master's thesis and kind of sitting on the other side of, of the table and realizing, okay, like these are all of the pieces that I'm trying to keep up with to, to bring something to this student as a co-supervisor. Um, and it's, it's a lot of weight and, and most faculties, at this point have you know fewer people than we'd like to be doing supervision um the, a lot of people are precarious all, all of those things are happening and so the more that frankly i think we can open up something like the dissertation process to this sense of being mentored and learning in chorus in public in a process that is visible and traceable right where people can can still see and maybe sometimes have to put up flags or go hey we have you know, serious differences that are going to um, cause a problem institutionally in this context. But it's important that maybe those supports are, are really there for students and those communities are really there for students and for faculty. Um, it's not necessarily, you know, a bad thing to have your student have many voices to hear from because that can take a little bit of, of the load off as well. It doesn't mean that you don't have to do the um, sort of the intensive reading and writing process, if that's part of what the dissertation process is in your context. But I think that broad sense of mentorship can be a value for everyone. And it gives the student the opportunity to take on a professional and scholarly voice much earlier than they do in that very odd kind of power role of, um, you know, supervisor student that sometimes can get reified in a um, in an institutional setting, and for a lot of us who are mid-career professionals who've been working in these these fields for a long time, suddenly being sort of just in a student role is 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 very um, disconcerting sometimes. So it it can also be just a way of managing one's own sense of um, capacity and agency through a process that can be sometimes not full of that. So, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll jump in. For a second. I wanted to add something, but I see Samantha wanted to speak there, so I'll wait, Samantha. Sorry, Catherine. Um, so, I am, I don't know, two Go months into, into all but dissertation phase. Um, my program's been fully online, and I've learned a lot about, you know, as someone who's taught online for a long time, I've learned a lot about being on the other side of a full program online and some things that I definitely want to change. Um, but as part of that, you know, the, our dissertation process actually already is open. Anybody could join in to any of the webinars because our, our defenses are all online and all part of your um, – I mean, all I'd have to do is give somebody the web, the GoToMeeting access code and they could come to it. But not, I think even, and, and some 
some other students have invited people into that process, people in their small cohorts, but it hasn't been a move and most of the advisors aren't really thoughtful or don't really understand why people would want to do that. Um, and it does still feel like this big mystery, even though I have people who are going through the process right now. But it's, it's, so it's, um, you know, so that part is good. But the other side of it, it, what Bonnie was talking about, about not feeling connected and feeling, you know, sort of like you're out there in the wilderness, that's kind of how I feel right now. I've had one conversation with my advisor. My advisor is a part time person. He's not somebody that I ever took a class with or know or worked with throughout the program. And while he's very responsive, um, I'm sort of stuck here and I'm my what I originally wanted to do is changing as I think about it I realize there's some problems with the framework or the you know the problem statement and things because so I'm I don't have I don't really feel like I have a network to even reach out to to get feedback on and what I'm looking at is sort of different than what anybody else is looking at so I don't know that anybody wants to hear what I have to say and I bore everybody around the dinner table who look at me like I'm crazy so that's kind of where I am right now and why the idea of an open dissertation um, for my own purpose is interesting but also just because um, just because I think that it's important to put that information out here. Like Bonnie, I'm a mid-career faculty member. We don't have tenure. I'm not worried about tenure. I'm not worried about the competitiveness of it. I'm not worried about sharing those ideas. Um, but I know that that's also an issue for some. So that's all I have. It's interesting. Uh, my program is a uh, cohort-based program. and. Um, we're finished all of our course, or all of our classes now, and we're just at the seminar stage where we're developing our proposals. And uh, we've been told that once classes are done, and we're no longer uh, with each other, that it can be a lonely journey. Um, but I think that, at least for us at Athabasca, if it's a cohort program, there are ways of staying with your cohort and receiving feedback there. Um, but I also think the openness aspect is good uh, because you're inviting um, other people, potentially other people who share your uh, uh, unique brand of uh, uh, craziness and what you're researching. Uh, that way you can get some good feedback. Um, and also you're, you can invite people who don't quite get what you're uh, researching. So you can also test the other group that might say, well, I see what you're doing, but I don't get it. Can you explain it to me? Absolutely. Laura, you wanted to talk about the different ways of being open. Laura? I think Catherine had something she wanted to say. Oh, sorry, Catherine. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, it's, we're we're at, we're weaving this as we go, aren't we? Um, the what I was thinking while a lot of you were speaking, um, and it's just been reinforced to the more people that are talking, is just how personal this is, and it's so difficult to give people advice um, because there are just so many strands to how one is open, and you know, you've raised some of these. So there's that that really personal agency and mentorship which um, you know you talked about a lot, Bonnie, and for me was a huge piece. I was you know, an open practitioner before I started PhD research, so I had a very wide network and was very active in that network, and so that just, that just followed me into the research. Although I had some identity issues um, to work out in going from more of a practitioner uh, role to a researcher. But then another piece that's come up is the piece about supervisors and committees, how amenable they are to openness and blogging and all that. Um, are you okay with um, using all the personal supports and having not having to negotiate that with your supervisor? You, it's not required. You know, you can still benefit from all of that uh, without negotiating that all with your with your supervisor or your committee. And then I think there's the broader open education agenda, which which I think about a lot, and and I know Bonnie and Laura did about um, kind of pushing out the boundaries for the scholars that we're walking with and that are walking um, after us about having an open dissertation and, and we have the agency perhaps to break some of the boundaries at our respective institutions. So that gets to some of the more political um, aspects of, of openness. So, um, you know, we've already hit on a number of these and, um, you know, I don't know if I answered any of the questions that came up earlier, but I suppose uh, in any discussions that I've had with other scholars thinking about um, an open dissertation it's just being clear about really what you're looking for you know what you need and what you're looking for because you don't have to do it all um, you know you don't have to be political you don't have to negotiate with your supervisor and so on so just 
um, think about what you need and what you want, um, and then look for support in those areas. Absolutely. I'm guessing that Laura's having some trouble because I'm seeing two of her. <laughs> well, that's usually the way I live. There's usually at least two of me in the room, so. <laughs> okay, your sister's working better. Go ahead, Laura. So y'all, y'all keep talking. I'll figure out what's going on with me later. <laughs> yeah, actually, your sound is good. So you were going to make a comment about. Um... Oh yeah, different ways of being open. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know, I've, I'm a kind of analytical soul. So I like to think about this in in categories and steps. And there's a whole bunch of different options. So we've been talking a lot about the process being open. And so the process can be open, you know, this idea of blogging or tweeting or sharing research or doing crowdsourced research or getting feedback in the open, you know, that sort of thing. The dissertation defense can be open, and we've touched on that as well, and there's different ways to do that. You know, you can do like Bonnie did. I'm going to check in. Can you he still hear me? Yes? Good. Can you hear me? Good? Okay. So like, you know, Bonnie um, actually live streamed her entire presentation. Like I said, I had people come in and live tweet. Uh -oh. Process, like I felt like it was embodying my, my entire process was to have people tweeting versus having it on screen. Um, but you know, so that those were choices, but there's all kinds of choices at the level of the defense. Um, you can Think about the format, or, or you know, Bonnie also mentioned we both have ours publicly, like CC license, so the actual product is out there, available for everybody. You can think about it in terms of the format um, and being accessible. So, like my 200 plus page document isn't really accessible to you know busy faculty members but I broke it down into handouts and PDFs and like different sections. Like I pulled out the nuggets from the dissertation to make them um, accessible to people who could actually use them in their practice. So that's a form of openness. Um, you know, Haystack uh, did this um, amazing seminar on like innovative ways to do dissertations like as a graphic novel or as a Tumblr page or you know, all kinds of different ways that you can um, present your research. Um, is that a form of openness? Uh, being accessible and usable to a broader audience? Mm -hmm. These are all things that we can talk about. Um, the thing is, is that there may be boundaries to people blogging their research, or there may be very real institutional boundaries mm -hmm. to having an open defense. Um, but that doesn't necessarily Have some way, and I'll stop talking now. Cool. You cut. You cut in a little bit at the end there. You cut out a bit. Um, I wanted to touch on so it's sort of because both you and Bonnie mentioned CC BY um, and Creative Commons, but I wanted to touch on the difference there because, like, I'm writing something that's going to be available to the public generally, you know, out there that kind of thing, but I'm still going to maintain the copyright on it, mm -hmm. right? Like I'm. I'm not willing to just let that happen because mine is so much about my personal story. But I, I think that we need to talk a little bit about the difference there. About copyright versus creative commons? Yeah. Okay. Just like like how much you know, like what do you mean by CC by? Is it just is are you are you letting people remix or just the the CC by like so there are a variety of Creative Commons licenses available um, and they can be applied to any kind of digital artifact or media product I guess including something as sort of conventional or traditional as uh, a paper so long as it's um, I, I, my paper copy still has CC BY on it, um, but the, it's the digital existence of CC BY that has really kind of brought it into um, common usage. And so you can choose something that, you know, demands specific attribution. You can choose something that demands, um, allows for certain remix pieces. I just went with the broad CC BY license. Um, 
so it's Creative Commons license. It's under my name. It, Creative Commons doesn't mean that people don't have to cite you, right? Um, it, it doesn't. It doesn't affect your um, your citation count. It doesn't affect your ownership in a sense of your or I guess the the idea is being tied to your name. But for me, my understanding was that it was really more around the idea of ownership and usage. And a lot of my perspective on the work that I was doing was that this open, openness and participatory work was valuable. Um, and so I wanted to keep a consistent approach uh, where it was possible for me to do so. And um, I looked at what the consequences kind of would, would be for me. Now, my, my work was a three paper thesis, right? So really the, the three papers all do happen to be openly available, but they are tied to my name under recognizable um, journal and citation pieces. And so the only part that really is solely covered by the CC BY license is kind of the full document. And really it's the um, intro and the closing that are that are truly CC BY because they have no other citation. And for me, particularly my, my conclusion is, is deeply personal as well. It's more of a reflective piece that tied it together. But my whole blog is CC BY. So I've always written anything personal under a CC BY license. And so for me, that was um, just, just a way of maintaining consistency with the work that, that I felt I had done and tried to do with the dissertation. I think Ken wanted to say so something. So can That's you hear me? Yeah. I don't think you can see me, but you can hear me. So my difference between maybe Rebecca's, to get the, Rebecca's point and what Bonnie's saying as well is Creative Commons is more about here's the license and you already have permission. You don't have to ask me because I've already proactively given you permission. That's really the core of Creative Commons versus copyright. And there's just all the different flavors because I tend to lean to CC BY, but then I'm thinking, oh, maybe I should put NC for no commercial on it so people can, like like Audrey Waters does on most of her work. And then I'm, I'm hedging back and forth between which flavor of CC I want to put on different things, right? And then Maha puts the point that she doesn't want it to be so open for videos like we're doing now. So there's there's all sorts of different flavors we should be thinking about and on different types of work. But I think it's really key that we should be talking to faculty and students about um, being open means giving that um, permission ahead of time. They don't have to come hunt Ken down to ask for permission to use my stuff. Yeah. And the interesting piece for me, why it wasn't an issue with the dissertation, was that really more so than most other digital artifacts, academics treat papers and documents as if they are already available for the asking. It's out there. Please cite it. Oh my God. Right? So the, the idea that you have to come and ask me to cite something would be against existing scholarly practice. Um, so to me, the default, uh, that's one of the places, actually one of the things I love about scholarly practice is that the idea is I have published this, it is out there for you to use. Um, and so CC BY for me just builds on that already, sort of always already existing invitation to please read, please cite, please, you know, please talk about this. Um, and I just didn't want to close that with a Creative Commons license. So that's kind of why I went with the CC BY. It, now it could, someone could decide to remix my dissertation into one of those interpretive dance competitions. And, you know, I'll be sad that I didn't take that beautiful opportunity to <clears throat> fully flower in that direction, but there you go. It's open. Fill your boots, people. I, w I wanted to see if Nadine wanted to try and ask a question. Um, I know she was having audio issues. Yeah, I'm not having audio issues anymore. I, was, I logged in from my phone. Thank you. Um, OK, so Bonnie was mentioning some of the risks about writing openly. And I just wanted to know exactly what these are, because you said you've researched a lot of the risks that would be associated with you writing openly, whether that's institu institutionally or other. So I just wanted to ask more about that. And obviously, if any uh, anybody else can share their um, their information about that. 
what I was referring to, uh, two particular things. One, Christina Costa uh, in Scotland has done some work on how institutions often see digital or open scholarship as deviant, right, as a deviant mode of practice. And so if you are sharing your work openly and blogging and tweeting about it, that can sometimes in different institutional contexts not only fail to be valued but actually be seen by certain uh, people who may be maybe not even consciously defending different or more traditional modes of participation and scholarship. Um, Sometimes it's dismissed as, oh, you know, that little thing that you do or, or whatever. More than that, uh, particularly for people who work in public and begin to gain visibility in public, there is the whole factor of um, abuse, of scale, of virality, of the ways in which particularly women, people of color, um, identities on the internet end up opening us to certain types of abuse, particularly at scale. And so if you become visible as a voice for whatever, then you risk having suddenly an audience that you may not want for your scholarship or that you may not be prepared to handle for your scholarship, um, that no one should have to be prepared to handle for their scholarship. So I mean, for people who, who research um, topical subjects, right? There's someone on, on Twitter, Kelly Baker, whose, whose work was on the Klan, and she has had to, I believe, close the Facebook page about her research because, particularly in the last month, she's talking about the Ku Klux Klan and white supremacy in public, and there are ways in which um, some of the feedback in a participatory world around that is extraordinarily abusive, disheartening, um, you know, awful to live through. And so publics are not neutral things. It can be wonderful to have an audience and a public for your work. And then occasionally it can also be truly, truly awful. And so when we, you know, I, I'm in favor, like I, I kind of put a, I threw my gauntlet down uh, a month ago at, uh, with the open ed presentation and just said, you know, I really think that actually we should make open the default. It doesn't mean that we should always do things or everything openly but rather that rather than having that default of closed, which was the default simply because that's what print demands. Um, you know, the, the journal system was actually a way of trying to open up the limitations of print and trying to make a scholarly system that was as open as it could be. But suddenly now we have, you know, way, way, way more capacity to be open than we've ever had. But our defaults are tend to still be stuck towards closed. Now, I think in continental Europe, dissertations tend to be open. Samantha, you said at your school, they're open. Um, when I first raised the, the, the conversation at my school, the first conversation I had about it was, I, I said, you know, was, was there any discussion of having um, the one person who went ahead of me, was there any discussion of having their defense open? And, and uh, someone looked at me as if I had a couple of heads. Um, I was really lucky that the people at my institution on my own committee, when I said, to them, is there a possibility for this? Um, they said, oh, well, that would be interesting. And I was really appreciative of that and the fact that they were willing to go to my dean and my dean was willing to say yes to it. But this was a, a new and sort of unknown territory for all the people in my institutional process who agreed to it. My, um, I would just kick in and say, we kind of did it um, without asking we assumed that the default should be open and just did it with the hopes that we would um, make it to start yeah. started questioning exactly what happened. Right, DC license on my, my dissertation. And um, at that point, it was helpful to have um, people behind me in the library. And so there were uh, people in our library who really stepped up and kind of squashed any sort of objections before they happened. Um, so having um, support in strategic places was extremely helpful. So um, I've got a question, maybe it's a sort of theoretical brainstorming one, but it's more around the soft skills. 
one of the uh, common things that I hear about or hear of is ask your advisor. When in doubt, ask your advisor or ask your committee. Or if your committee says you need to do this, then you need to do whatever they say in order for you to graduate. Um, I'm a big fan of open peer review, so putting out a document either in its entirety or in small pieces as um, I think Laura mentioned to make it more user friendly and to get peer review um, and get some feedback. Now what happens when your feedback clashes with what your advisor say? So you've got your community which is taking time to give you feedback, uh, presumably because they care for you and seeing you through this, um, and you've got your committee who are in the centers of gatekeepers. Um, what happens when those views clash and how might one go about reconciling this? Does anybody? I did have a little bit of that occasionally. Um, my, I did not have direct conflict between those two pieces, but there were times when um, my advisors and, or, or at least members of my committee, uh, did not necessarily see things quite the same um, as, frankly, my research participants or the public community of sort of broader network scholars that I was opening some of the, the feedback or opening some of my, my draft conclusions to feedback from. Um, and there was really, there was value for me in those tensions because it actually did exactly what that process is meant to do, which was gave me things to kind of push against each other. But in the end, um, I broadly, I was studying these participants. And so when sometimes they were more deeply embedded in the world that I was studying than some members of my committee were, not all members of my committee. And so I would bring the conversation back to the committee and try to you know, as, as politely as, and there's, there's power pieces involved. Um, but to try to sort of say like, look, th this is my understanding. This is partly experiential, um, partly based on their experiences and feedback. Um, I had uh, one member of my committee who was, was more of a, an active presence, um, a really very significant active presence in this space in a way that, that not all of them were. And so we were able to bring it to a conversational place. And because it was my content, then as committee members and supervisors, they, they kind of had a place where they could go, oh, okay, well, you know, I'm seeing where this is being held up. Now, I think, had I been studying something entirely different, had I been studying, you know, monkeys and the people who talk on Twitter and in blogs about monkeys versus my scholarly committee and experts about monkeys, those two things are going to be harder to reconcile. In those cases, I think you've probably really got to go with the institutional expertise. But if you're studying how our institutions are changing, and you've got everyone's kind of on different places on a spectrum in terms of their perspectives on that change, then you've really got to take your experts and weigh them together with your, or sorry, your institutional experts and weigh them together with all the other institutional experts who may be part of your study and part of your larger community. Um, yeah, monkeys, that's my, my new thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, my Laura, wanted, Laura wanted to make a point here. Um, she's having audio issues, so I'm gonna make it for her. Um, so she's saying that um, it was really, really important that she had the support of her supervisor. Um, in this and I think that that is sort of a message that's coming out right there's there's actually support from different levels because I'm hearing like Bonnie said she had to have the technical support right she's able to do it because she had people that were there in that technical space but there's also the support of the committee members and the supervisors that all sort of need to be on board ish mine all were wonderful because they were willing Right, and even where we didn't necessarily all agree or all necessarily see our way clear, they were open and willing to have conversations about change. Um, so that that was hugely. I'm I'm incredibly grateful for just that willingness to be part of something that wasn't necessarily a known quantity for them, and not every senior faculty member at every institution is going to be as willing and as gracious about that process as mine were. Does anybody have any thoughts on how we can 
encourage when we're dealing with that barrier? Yes, if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. For a minute? Okay. So one of the things that I'm working on is developing a educational tool um, that goes through the different ways that things could be open because I think sometimes some faculty member gets scared um, you know, because they do think it's a black and white issue. You either have to be all in or not in at all. Um, and so I'm trying to find ways to help students talk about this with their faculty members um, where it looks logical, where we can break it down into pieces, where we can talk about bits and pieces and not necessarily have to be all in. Yeah, and I'll add something there. I love what you both just said, Bonnie and Laura, and I, and I do think that as an open education community, those of us who can should really try to do that more kind of activist or political work because, you know, we have, we can talk about the theory of digital education and network learning and participatory culture and having those arguments really helps us to make the case. So, you know, we can be, um, if, if it's possible for us um, to work that, I think it's really important for us as open educators um, to kind of work that at our respective institutions as and when we can um, because, you know, it's all to the good for many other scholars, you know, not just ourselves. So, you know, and Bonnie, you most definitely have done that, and Laura, you have, and I think probably most of the people in this Hangout can, but that's that kind of third strand I was talking about before, which, you know, not everybody is able to do, but us as open education researchers, you know, we're, we're in a prime location, most of us, to be able to do that, and I see that as very much part of my work. Also, I'm Just actively saying. working on something right now, so if anyone has time and is interested in working with me on developing something that we can use as a tool to talk to faculty members about the different types of open and open dissertations, please contact me. Working on it, active, well, kind of actively. It's, it's, it's on the, the list, <laughs> the top five. I'm putting my hand I'm up. In. Yes, I'd love to help. I'm in, I'm in for that, yeah. See, whereas, I'm in, but I'm still interested in monkeys. This was why I said monkeys. This is, I, it's a snow day here, so my, I farmed my children out for an hour to talk to you guys, but their little toys are all over the house, so. <clears throat> the monkey and I are just hanging out. I've got a lot to learn about the monkey. That monkey looks nefarious. We're coming up towards the end of the hour, although we did start a few minutes late, so we've got a few more minutes, but I'm wondering if um, anyone has uh, last questions, because we are running out of time. So I, I thought it was interesting, um, Rebecca, when you were um, talking about your concern about sort of feeling like you would have to give up your ideas, your intellectual pro property, and I feel like, that's a recurring theme for us in academia. I know in the OER work that I'm doing at my college, I have a number of colleagues who are who, who feel very strongly about, you know, they, their intellectual property is their value. It's their it's what they are it's what they're paid for, but it's and and sharing it would undermine their value. Um, and we had an, an interesting conversation in which at the end of it, I was just like, yeah, but I feel like I'm part of a community and I have a responsibility to give back to that community. Um, so how do we open that conversation in such a way? I mean, I think earlier in the chat, there was a conversation about how competitive academia is. And it is. If you think about, you know, people who are, who are fighting for tenure. Um, and the need to be the first author on an article because you didn't count unless you're the first art author and all of those kinds of things. So there's, and and I'm sorry, I'm sort of randomly associating. I think back to Mike Caulfield's um, conversation about institutionalization. How do we look at the institutional structure that, um, the institutional assumptions that we make that um, undermine being more open with our research? So that's my question. How do we think about the institutional assumptions that we make or how do we visualize the institutional assumptions that are made that undermine or um, push people away from the ideas of open? AK, go ahead. I think uh, one of the 
things that I've seen, at least in academia, I don't know if it's spread elsewhere, um, but there's a confusion between where the value proposition is, whether it's the product that is created or the skills and the process of the individual. Um, and I think that is a sort of big pitfall that a lot of uh, my colleagues uh, fall into. So I don't think, while the product has a certain value, it's only an instantiation of what I as an individual can do. And also what I in, as an individual in a network and with network connections can do. So while I've done some work, I think most of my good stuff, so to speak, uh, comes from collaborating with other people and how those individuals pushed me to think outside of the box in ways that I wouldn't have thought about before. So um, I think my value to the institution comes from that process, that process of working. And if I create something now, it's only just um, a token of that. It's not the, um, uh, like the item itself that has the value. Um, and I think that's what I tell people uh, about the value of open. So when you are sharing something uh, with a Creative Commons license, you're showing other people what you are capable of doing uh, and hence uh, sort of proving future value in a sense. I really like the way you're putting that. The other thing that that focus on process and network brings is the capacity to bring things out more quickly to a public. I mean, I, I value, you know, the to some extent, I guess, the ways in which we formalize our thinking in, in papers. But the, the, the academic publishing process at this point is such a bizarre and strange, um, <clears throat> slow and uh, predatory often process that I, I think that one of the things that open scholarship and, and, and more of a default to open can do even though I realize that there are disciplinary differences and values in terms of what is, um, you know, how much value is placed on having the new thought or the thing that can get the patent. And I'm lucky enough not to work in that kind of field. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't carry that weight to the same extent. But I really see that, you know, increasingly with less and less public funding for scholarship, um, it's it's important that we are getting you use the term value proposition the value proposition of the things that we do out to the public so that they can affect and maybe making it less of a hey we you know came in to study you as a particular public and rather working with publics rather than on publics and the more that we are working in the open the more sort of accountability there is and the quicker that ideas are, are getting out and circulating with publics. And so I see some real value just in um, making a value proposition for academia in terms of open research in general, not just open dissertations, but sort of open practices and open network scholarship. How do you imagine a, um, a peer review network? I mean, I think one of the arguments that I've heard about um, um, academic or academic research and or the publishing of research is that the peer review process is so important to quality. Um, so this is not necessarily my argument, but this is the argument that I think that's put puts out there a lot. Um, the peer review process is so important to good quality and we have to pay people to peer review. And so how does how do we establish an academic community that's willing to do peer review as part of their job? To I know it's a crap argument, <laughs> um, but how, how do we establish a, a, an academic community that's willing to, to participate in that peer review process in an open and collaborative way, um, much like virtually, or not virtually connecting, but hybrid pedagogy is doing and things like that. How do we expand that kind of model um, and get institutions to, uh, to uh, adopt that. Um, I know that there's a lot of suspicion among people who are totally disconnected from this kind of conversation to blogs and to other forms of research. They just, you know, automatically reject that. So how do we change that? That's what I mean by some of the institutional assumptions that we have that only good quality can come from this blind, closed peer review process. Um, 
So that's my other piece. Of I, I just want to return. Who's getting paid to peer review? Because I'm doing it all wrong, man. I'm <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's the I don't even have an academic job, but I'm getting asked to do this for free. It doesn't even count as service. I have got this wrong. So we're going to have to meet afterwards and you can explain. <laughs> I, I think that's the argument for why services like Juster and, and those other services have these, and the journals have these, these um, closed processes is because they're there and then then a paid for process is and the, why you have to pay for those journals is to pay for that process so i don't know that's the argument that has been made yeah, and i mean so much of academia academia is a prestige economy right and it, it is a different prestige economy from the open circulation of ideas which has its own prestige stuff um, and so we have, you know, all sorts of prestige signals that we circulate in network scholarship and open scholarship, but they don't necessarily all map up exactly with the types of prestige signals that are understood within institutions. And those differ from country to country and all of those things too. But we all kind of get acculturated to this is what counts. And then people, the people for whom it works, one, become invested in the system, and two, generally are not um, what's the word? Not motivated isn't quite the word. Incentivized to try anything else because this is working for them. And so then they tend to teach their students that this is how you do it. And so we, we still have this really odd prestige economy that 20 years ago it was announced, oh my god, it's the end of academic publishing. It's the web. And instead what happened was we ended up with a monopoly of about five companies that run the majority of the academic publishers and they're making more like like almost a, a, a thousand times the money that they were 20 years ago. I can't remember what the exact numbers are, but it, it's, it's actually quite a crazy system that even the people who are benefiting from it often will go, yeah, you know, I think there is something a little off there and possibly the value is in having other people critique your work. Possibly we do critique differently when we're blind than when, when names are blinded or identities are blinded, but so often when that blinding process, people often do have a sense of whose work they're looking at once they're experts in a given field. Two, um, there is a lot of evidence that shows that people are just kind of jerks replicating power and the little circles that they know when they're reviewing blind. And so, you know, we need, if we're not gonna, we're not going to fully be able to change it until A, we're offering alternative models. B, we're teaching people that the prestige economy of networks is not necessarily fully counter to the prestige economy of academia. But three, we start unpacking what that prestige economy is based in and where the actual sort of black boxes and empty holes are. Sorry, there's a really good uh, back channel going on over yeah. here too. I'm so distracted. I'm reading, I, I'm reading too. I was, can open help if you are not employed full time? Open in in my study. Um, so just my my dissertation study. Uh, I looked closely. It was an ethnography. I looked closely at 13 different people. Um, only a few were actually sort of well established senior scholars, and it was often the people who had the most either institutionally or personally identified, like um, in terms of personal identities, marginalized positions or some combination of the two who found the most significant value in networked and open participation because they were able to build visibility and voice in ways that their institutions often didn't allow them to do. So it was particularly for PhD students who wanted to get their ideas out. Um, it was particularly for people who otherwise for whatever reasons, were not necessarily being heard in the locations where they worked and lived, um, that there was a particular payoff. Now, there was also a huge time cost um, because there's a lot of energy and time that goes into building the kinds of networks that allow you to, to succeed you know, in working in the open. It's, it's great to publish your stuff, but if no one is reading it, then, then there is not necessarily a value. So there's a give and take there where people have to build the visibility that allows them um, to, in, to engage fully in that or to benefit from it. And that trade-off when you're working two jobs and all that stuff can be, can be hard for, for many people. Um, a lot of us are still living it. I have, you know, I've chosen to kind of keep doing as much open stuff as I can do, 
but I've put caps on the free reviewing that I will do for scholarly journals, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, I don't review for closed ones anymore. Um, so I'm finding ways of kind of protecting what time I have as someone whose work is, is still somewhat precarious um, by valuing more of the open work rather than necessarily all of the traditional pieces of work. But if I, you know, if I want to keep a hand in that prestige economy, I still need to be publishing and reviewing and speaking and, and, and doing all those things. And some of those things I love, but it's hard. How much, um, I have a question, because all, I think everybody here is, or many here are at least in a, in a thesis or dissertation process. Um, what Laura's granular openness pieces, how many of you saw the um, blog post that she did about sort of the visualizing a model for different choices around openness? What ones do you see as hardest for you to enact in your context, and which ones do you see as sort of easiest or, or most, um, most likely for you to enact? Which ones would be the, the low-hanging fruit, and which ones would be the hardest? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm challenged right now with putting out ideas that are not fully baked yet, you know, because I have, I'm a, I'm a, an avid blogger, right? I always write things down and I always, you know, and so I want to get to that point and I watch Mahabali um, blog as much as she blogs and I'm like, I'd love to be able to put those half thought out, out thoughts out there, but I also worry that they're half thoughts and that they're not you know, that, that they're going to be misinterpreted as full thoughts, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Okay, so that totally happened to me last week because I threw out an infographic, which was a half-baked thought, and like half the world jumped onto it and were critiquing it. And I mean, like I got a really quality peer review out of this and ended up making something that I'm very proud of. Um, but yeah, so I threw out a half-baked Maha and I were talking about it in the back channels because I was like, oh my gosh, people are taking this seriously and it's like half-baked. And she's like, honey, that's because it's an infographic and they always look polished. You need to put draft across the top of it. I'm like, of course, that's just so obvious. Yes, I can do that. So maybe my, my point here is a huge metaphorical uh, draft watermark somewhere on the work. Um, just, but 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 the other thing that came out of this is that it was half baked. Y'all made it so much better. You did a great job making it powerful, um, and and it turned into something um, kind kind of um, meaningful for a lot of people. Um, so the process was very valuable. But yeah, I should have had a giant draft watermark on the first one. I think uh, the uh, hashtag half bake is going to really uh, start coming into use. Um, I actually don't mind posting half baked ideas because most of what I post on my ID blog is half baked anyway. Um, it's just a, a way for me to process my thinking in journal form so that other people can give me feedback on it. Um, I thought about doing closed journal for personal reflections, I'm like, what's the point? I'm going to write it down once, I'm going to think about it, and I'm not going to come back to it until I think it's a good idea again. And it's like, oh, yeah, I thought about this before, but I didn't do anything with it. Uh, putting it on the blog as a half-baked idea gives other people an opportunity to say, no, AK, this is complete BS, and it's not going to work for this and this and this reason, uh, in which case I can say, oh, that makes sense, so I'm not going to waste my time. Uh, or it's kind of rough, but it could work if you think about these five other factors and maybe here's a reference that you might want to chase down and that might be a reference that I never really thought about and that might open doors that I could have never foreseen on my own. I think for me, um, <laughs> the the energy investment is is hard um while i can play an introvert or an extrovert really well on tv i'm um i'm really not <laughs> so sometimes that you know even the virtual connections 
feel very like public and that's really hard for me sometimes. Um, and so I kind of go in spurts and I, that it's hard to maintain that kind of network for, for me. Um, I'm going to have to bring this to a close. We're coming on, um, we're just over an hour and I know that the transcription automatic transcription only works for an hour and 15 minutes as well. So, um, and, uh, I really, really want to thank Laura and Bonnie, um, for coming to this conversation as sort of guests, because I think that, you know, and, and inspiring it with the presentation they did at Open Ed. And I know they had other collaborators as well. Um, but um, yeah, so I guess I just wanna leave it for last thoughts and then we'll close off. Laura says bye Can and I thanks. Just thank everybody. You guys just made me really excited about starting my thesis writing phase because I was really worried about that. And I was just talking to Maha about the option of writing it openly, but then I was also very uh, shaky about it. And she was like, oh, you have to join this conversation. And I, I just want to thank you all. You, you just sort of gave me the push and the motivation to do that. And it's not, it's not as hard or as difficult as I thought it would be. Hopefully, fingers crossed. I'm just saying this from before. I will definitely keep you updated with the process, but this was, this was very beneficial for me. That's so great. Please do, because the thing is, right, now that mine is behind me, the idea of looking at other people's work, of, of going, oh, that's what you're doing. Oh, that's really interesting. I learned so much from watching people think out loud, right? And so I wouldn't be able to engage with, with your thesis process in the same way that I would if you were my student, but it might be a dip in, dip out kind of thing where Every now and then, there's there's some little piece that twigs that that shapes things. And when you've got you know a hundred people in your community who are all doing that, there's real value there. And that that was what I found was just that that sort of sense of doing it in chorus. It made me less lonely in the process, but it was also an incredible learning experience. And it meant that when the work came out, people were excited to see it. You know, which it's nice to have your work received into the world. Um, after all those years of working on a thesis and, and have people, you know, kind of waiting for it. All right. On that note, I'm going, right. to, on that note, I'm going to close the live broadcast. Um, and yeah. Okay. So here we go. Closing the live broadcast if I hit the right button. Mm -hmm.